Good afternoon, everyone. This is Meredith Ward with NASIO. Welcome to the fifth and final NASIO Cyber Webinar in our uh, Cyber Webinar series. Thanks for joining us and also for celebrating National Cybersecurity Awareness Month with NASIO. Uh, we do hope that this isn't the first one in the series that you've attended, but um, if it is, you can check out the other webinars on our website, nasio.org forward slash cyber series. But today, in our final webinar of the series, I'm pleased that the state of South Dakota is going to share with us how they educate and train staff and elected officials on the threatening aspects of email phishing. Jim Edmond is our featured speaker today, and Jim is the deputy CIO and CISO for the state. Uh, but just before Jim takes over a couple of housekeeping items, I want to remind everyone that you're in listen-only mode, which means you're muted. So we'll be accepting questions in the question uh, box on the right of your screen, and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. Thanks so much for joining us today, and Jim, take it away. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, appreciate you giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about our email assessment program that we've been doing here in South Dakota. Uh, on a bigger picture, I need to extend a, a significant amount of gratitude to Nasio and Doug and Meredith for all of the opportunities you've presented to the CISOs across the country and giving us a chance to network and get together, whether it's at the annual conference or at our own CISO get together. Certainly appreciate all of the time and effort that you folks have put together for creating this CISO community, which has been extremely effective for, for all of us across the states here. And as Meredith mentioned, a um, program that we call Walleyes, Whales, and Cybersecurity has to do with our email assessment and educate, educating and training employees on the risks of phishing, uh, testing them, and in some cases, applying the consequences if, if our uh, testing fails for them. First, South Dakota it was certainly not one of the uh, largest states across the country. And our budget is a little bit under $5 billion, with uh, about 1.6 of that come from a general fund or a, a sales tax nature. Uh, FTE wise, we have less than 14,000, of which about 60% of those are state government, and the rest are higher education. Some uh, miscellaneous stats, uh, our population is uh, extremely small at uh, a little under 900,000 and uh, spread that across to 77,000 square miles. And, and most of the state doesn't even qualify as rural country. Most of it is a uh, frontier, if uh, you're aware of what the definitions of those are. So obviously we're pretty proud to be the home of uh, mount rushmore if that's something that has not been on your bucket list uh, certainly you should uh, should add it to it's a beautiful national monument in the black hills state fish is a walleye hence uh, in the title walleyes whales and Cybersecurity. our our folks in north dakota minnesota wisconsin michigan Few others can certainly attest to the uh, value that walleye brings to the fishing industry in, in those various states also. Uh, the last bit of trivia states uh, may not be aware of is this past summer, uh, the state of South Dakota was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court arguing a case of state of South Dakota versus Wayfair. You may be familiar with Wayfair, they're one of the uh, bigger online uh, retailers. Anyway, uh, going all the way back to 1992, in a case of North Dakota versus Quill, uh, the Supreme Court established the precedent that states could only collect sales tax if a company had a physical presence in that state. So as the internet has exploded and Amazon and all these other companies come online, it was purely on a voluntary basis whether they would submit or, or remit sales tax to state governments. Uh, we thought this was somewhat uh, 
an unfair playing field to our brick and mortar companies, along with, frankly, uh, we're interested in getting the sales tax revenue. So we passed a law saying that we were going to collect it. It went to court. Obviously, the courts denied it, and we appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, we gathered 40 other states uh, behind us in our arguments in this past June. The Supreme Court ruled five to four in our favor. So state governments, all of us, have the opportunity to now collect sales tax um, based on online sales. This is another statistic or graph that I like to show. It somewhat demonstrates to our constituents where their money is spent. Of every dollar, 75 cents is spent towards education and or taking care of people. So it, it always interests me when individuals say that, you know, we need to cut state government and save money and so forth. But uh, 75 cents out of every dollar that is spent or invested from a tax perspective goes towards those types of categories. So interesting uh, statistics there and something I like to show in, in um, a lot of groups are surprised when they find out that's where most of the money is being spent. A little bit of background on uh, Bureau of Information and Telecommunications. Uh, we're a highly centralized IT organization, have been centralized since uh, 1996 is when our executive order was issued. Approximately 9,000 computers and laptops across the state, uh, 1,000 wide area network sites, 1,100 business applications that our own developers have uh, built and maintained, another 700 or so commercial off-the-shelf stuff. Our clientele, in addition to the executive branch and constitutional offices, we provide some support to the court system also. Uh, we provide all the networking to higher education, Internet 1, Internet 2, along with some distance learning. And finally, our K-12 services are rather extensive from email hosting to networking to security services to web hosting and, and on down the line. So we got a fairly wide set of clientele. Our internet usage on a regular basis averages around 14 and a half gigabits per second. So that sets a little bit in regards to the scope of the clientele that we deal with when, within our IT world. From a uh, cyber perspective, uh, we're all well aware there are a lot of pieces to the puzzle to uh, protect our gold. Um, Awareness and education is just one small aspect of it. I like to use this graph when talking to folks to try and give them a sense that there is no one silver bullet when we're doing cybersecurity. Instead, there's a lot of pieces to the pie, and some of them overlap, and some of them are somewhat independent. But there's a lot of pieces that go into protecting ourselves. Now I'll talk a little bit in regards to the, the, the problem at hand for us, and, and that's trying to get our employees to recognize phishing messages and, and simply either report them or delete them. Back in 2017, when we started our statewide phishing attempts, as you can see, the failure rates were pretty significant. Uh, from over 50% to 30 to the 20, um, this was highly alarming to us. You know, failure rates at this degree were somewhat indicative that uh, it wouldn't be too long before somebody actually gave up their credentials or clicked on a piece of malware or whatever it might be and caused a significant amount of damage. So this was the alarm that went off in regards to our tracking of the problem. So uh, what did we do to go about addressing it? Um, the first thing we did was we established a baseline policy in working with our Bureau of Human Resources. Um, Someone came to the conclusion that unless we had significant support up and down the political food chain, our ability to do anything would be somewhat limited. So uh, 
We worked very well with our partners at Human Resources along with the governor's office and established a policy. And then around that, the soap lather, rinse, repeat process of the fishing includes designing the theme. Uh, we use a tool called Go Fish, uh, launching our monthly campaigns, uh, recording the clicks that come with them. And then the reporting aspect is another important piece of it. So the policy is the foundation. The other aspects are what occur on, on a cyclical basis. Keeping in mind somewhat our simple goals for this whole process, and most importantly, trying to educate folks so that they are aware of A, what the risks are with fishing, why you don't want to give up your credentials, why do you don't want to download that attachment that you may not be familiar with, and secondly, of course, how to go about safeguarding state resources. You know, one of the things we did early in the process here was to add EXT, representing external for messages coming into our email system. You know, that's pretty much a standard these days across organizations. Um, but just as that first step for employees to look at it, you know, the message may not necessarily be bad, but be on guard. Be a little more wary of that message in comparison to that, something that may be delivered internal. Uh, trying to educate folks on you, slow down. Do not be in a hurry in regards to clicking and downloading and reading through messages. Probably our number one recommendation there is just to slow down. Sometimes here in the Midwest, I think we're a little more trusting. You know, that, that double-edged sword comes back to hurt us in situations like this. You know, we need to be a little more skeptical on messages that we're, we're receiving. You know, trying to educate folks and, and look on the sender. Just don't believe that the alias is that. Double-click on the uh, from area and find out specifically you know, who it is from. You know? It's from a you know, Gmail domain. It's from a, a domain of question. Again, another flag. Frankly, getting folks to read the content. Um, again, from being in a hurry, trying to get folks to slow down, take a moment, read the message, see if it makes sense. You know, fishing messages are far more creative these days than the Nigerian prince asking for money. So, you know, if we take the time to read the content, you know, that may raise an alarm also. You know, finally hover over links, you know, something us as technologists are very familiar with, but hover over the link. Does the domain resolve to the same as from the email address? You know, does it make sense? You know, again, just trying to add tips to the analysis process so that they become second nature to folks. And, and finally, if everything else fails, you know, submit the message to our spam box. We'll look at it. If it's a phishing message, we'll go in and remove it across the entire mail system. Uh, we share a mail system with our K-12 community, so we can work back and forth in taking messages out of the government and K-12 system. You know, Again, our whole process with this is, is to educate and train folks. And this is not only tips that are useful at work, but they can be used at home also. It's not a punishment oriented thing, but we do have consequences and expectations in regards to the performance. Now, I mentioned the uh, policy is somewhat the foundation of what we put together here. And, and the foundation of the policy says that Employees are required to take cybersecurity training annually. It gives us, BIT, the authority to assess individuals. And we can test them via phishing. We can perform social engineering, uh, mobile media tests, whatever next year's uh, latest and greatest uh, approach might be. It gives us the ability, and it tells the employees that you will be tested on this. And then I think uh, the aspect of the policy that is fairly unique when looking across other policies in the country is that there's consequences 
And if, if you fail the, the assessment, you know, the first consequence, if you first fail you, nothing happens. Uh, the second one, you get notified, and uh, we also notify the department head. Third, the same thing happens. You get notified as an individual, and you also get the opportunity to attend one of our in-person trainings uh, held within the state. And then the fourth one, we've somewhat come to the conclusion that education and training may not be working for you. So we're going to do a technological review of what you have access to, and we're going to limit that in some manner. Now, from a training perspective, uh, our annual training started in July. Uh, our goal was to be 100% by Cybersecurity Month. Uh, which obviously is in October. Our goal for the end of the week is to be at 100%. Um, the updated numbers this morning are actually at 97%. Will we hit 100%? I doubt it. You know, there are some folks that simply uh, will not get it done in time. But uh, I think that we will be able to hit the 98% level, which I think is uh, still pretty successful for uh, an education and training effort. Now getting into the process of our assessment methodology. And the first step that we go through is that we ingest our global address list to make sure that we have the latest and greatest accounts from an email perspective. You know, state government and employment is a very fluid animal. And so we want to make sure that individuals that have left state government, those accounts are not included in the test but yet new individuals that have come on board, they are included. So we ingest the global address list uh, every month into our tool. Secondly, we go through the step of uh, designing the actual phishing message. Okay. Sometimes we use actual phishing messages that have been received by different employees, uh, adjust them to some extent, but for the most part, uh, we use them as they come in natively. Other times we create our own message and, and what we're looking for in a message, you know, is the topic current? Is there an emotional grab to it? Uh, do we address them personally? How about on an individual level? Is there something that may catch them from a home perspective? And then finally, uh, state employees are somewhat uh, thrifty in a manner. So if we offer something up for free, uh, they're more than likely to catch it. You know, and really, none of what we're doing is any different than what the nefarious characters are going to do out there, the bad actors on the net. You know, they're going to look for that emotional grab. They're going to take advantage of the South Carolina hurricane or any other national events that may occur and try and get money. So what we're doing from a design perspective is really somewhat trying to mimic the bad actors out there. Most of the time on the messages that we send out, uh, we can send them out on our own. On some occasions though, we look for coverage from the governor's office and get their support on them. Next, I, I got a set of uh, samples that I'll walk through and you can take a look at the actual messages that we've used. This one is on that individual level. You know, we use the logo within state government on SDGov. Uh, we address it in an individual manner with the email address, first name and last name. But from an education perspective, an interesting aspect on this one is that if you're looking in the blue circle, you can tell that it's EX and it's an external message. The other blue circle says that it's coming from state.sd.us. So we're spoofing the state.sd.us domain and sending it into the email system. Though there's a couple of exceptions to this, uh, for the most part, our email gateway policies you know, don't allow a legitimate state.sd.us message to come into the domain. Now, obviously, this is just a alias attached to an email address, but our point is in trying to educate employees 
hey, first of all, it's EXT. Secondly, it's from our domain. You know, that shouldn't happen. You know, so that should be an initial right away indicator to go ahead and delete the message. That particular message had a uh, failure rate of about 20% for us. Our state legislature meets from January to March every year. Uh, we sent this message out in February, had a huge emotional pull to it and saying the legislators are not going to give us a raise. Uh, KSFY is a local TV station. You know, so I had a lot of legit legitimacy to it, other than if you would have actually clicked on the from address and hovered over the link. You know, employees, if they would have looked at they would have noticed that those were not legitimate. This, uh, this particular message is somewhat our poster child for phishing in that uh, over 50% failed the state raise, the employee raise message. This message with UPS was something that we did last month, and, and frankly, I thought it was ugly and that nobody would click on it. We had a failure rate of 10% on it. Uh, evidently, a lot of state employees buy school supplies online in August because uh, we had an extraordinarily high click rate on this particular message. And so when folks click on any of the URLs we included in there, what it takes them to is it can take them to a video or a landing page that's going to explain immediately what they should have recognized with the message and why they should not have clicked on it. So that's where we take them to if they click on a particular message or a link within the message, not the message itself. The message itself is fine. But once they click on a link or the attachment, then that's when we we record the failure. A, another message with the combination of a state.sd.us domain uh, plus the ext flag, and uh, this was a free thing, giving away free state fair tickets. You know, all of the logos and branding that we use are all publicly available. There's nothing that we hijack from an internal perspective. It's all gathered from publicly available information, Google Images, Bing, wherever it may be. Uh, this message on the free uh, tickets, 20% uh, failure rate on this one. Now again, uh, back to the title of uh, Walleyes, Whales, and Cybersecurity. Whales being those high-level executives um, that on some occasion can be just as gullible as any other state employee. This particular message was sent to the Lieutenant Governor earlier in September. Uh, Lieutenant Governor happens to be a huge Green Bay Packers fan. Green Bay Packers fan. Uh, Bill and Mike uh, may somewhat appreciate uh, that support, but uh, Anyway, Lieutenant Governor is a big Packers fan. First game of the season, their quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, gets hurt, gets taken out of the game, comes back, wins the game. But later in that same week, uh, we put together this phishing message, sent it to him, and said, hey, Aaron Rodgers is out for the season. You know, had a lot of interest, um, has that emotional appeal, and so forth. Now, fortunately, the lieutenant governor did not fall for it. He immediately sent me a message saying, ha, tried to get me, but I'm too smart. So that whaling on our senior executives is just as important as what we do, you know, with the regular staff. Now, moving on to the, uh, the next part of our process is the configuring the open source tool that we use GoFish. You know, I mentioned when individuals click on the URL uh, within the message, you know, it either takes them to a video that we have built or a website where we want to provide that immediate feedback that says, hey, this is what you should have recognized with the message and why it was a phishing message. We make sure our logs are all ready to go, and then we go ahead and 
we launched the campaign. Now we fish all employees on a monthly basis, executive branch and constitutional offices. Uh, we used to do the court system till one of the judges uh, fell for our test and she had a tantrum and then had us taking them out of the uh, out of the scope. So they may come back in. We're in conversations now with the chief justice and others to try and convince them that it's in their best interest. They, like any other aspect of government, certainly have confidential and sensitive information to protect. We deliver over 7,000 messages a month. Uh, we typically spread them over three weeks, uh, varying the days of delivery. They're not all on Mondays, they're not all on Fridays. Uh, we vary it accordingly. Next step for the process is that we make sure that as those clicks occur, they're recorded on the web server logs, and then we ingest all those logs and simply into Microsoft Access. And then the final and key aspect of the whole process is, is the reporting piece of it. Uh, we use a business analytics tool called Microsoft Power BI. It's uh, flexible, we have the ability to export data. Uh, the native graphing in it is okay. I wouldn't say it's spectacular, but, uh, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Some of the standard reports that we get out of it is uh, these are all our monthly campaigns. Uh, January of 2018, employees verify info, all the way to September there with IT alerts, total number of messages sent, and then how many were clicked on. We also provide a departmental view for the year, which I send to each department head on a monthly basis. And finally, uh, as part of the consequence aspect of it, we have reporting on an individual layer. So Power BI records our failures, all of the failures on an individual level. We also have reports on multiple failures, and we also have spreadsheets that are created that identify individually who I need to contact on a monthly basis in regards to their degrees of performance. Our consequence aspect of this, you know, for the first failure, nothing happens to them. Hopefully they get the video or the website and they read through it. Upon the second failure though, then I send a message to them individually uh, indicating information in regards to the importance of cybersecurity and provide them a, a longer, more in-depth video for them to follow. I also include the department secretary on that message. And, and the reason we go all the way to the top of the department secretary is frankly, we do not have access to who their individual manager is. So, you know, we simply go to the top of the food chain and let inform them again, not from a punishment perspective, but saying, hey, this is how your staff is doing. Third failure is we go through the same exact thing. We notify the staff, department secretary, and then we give them an opportunity to sign up for an in-person class training in regards to fishing. Our very own uh, Professor Penny holds an hour to hour and a half class. We do it in three different locations across the state. A very informative walking through in detail, you know, what the risks are of fishing and how to recognize some of the triggers that are embedded within our messages. Finally, uh, fourth or more failure, uh, we set up a meeting with them individually, our points of contact who are our customer liaisons, uh, meet with the individual. We do a technological review of what they have access to. We come up with ways on how we can better protect ourselves from a technological perspective. That may mean you know, applying multi-factor authentication for their access, uh, whitelisting applications from their desktop, uh, removing software on their desktop if it's not used on a regular basis or access to various applications, or limiting their access to various network drives or whatever it may be. The point being, at this step, we're going to do what we can technologically to better protect 
state resources. A little bit more on the in-person training here after the third failure. Again, at three locations across the state where we allow the opportunity for the employees to come in, led by one of our own staff. We shoot for about an hour. If there's questions, sometimes it's a little more. So far, we've had over 150 attendees since April. And then, unfortunately, we've had nearly 40 at the 40 plus failure mark. This is how we're doing on a statewide basis for 2018. A high mark of 21% in January, a low mark of uh, under 1%. Our October test that uh, was launched earlier this morning looks like uh, we're running at about 13% of those being clicked on so far. Some of the important lessons that we've learned, uh, unfortunately, content is king. You know, for as much as we try and educate and analyze and get folks to read the message, um, messages with that emotional grab to them are still being clicked on. So we gotta find a way to neuter that emotional response to messages that are of interest. You know, smartphones and the ability to analyze and look at messages on a phone simply isn't as good on a computer. So getting folks not to multitask, just as much as trying to get them not to text and drive, uh, not to read email when they're mobile either. Really what we found to be the most successful tip is just asking folks to slow down. You know, if people will take their time and go through the tips that we provide, I think we can easily get our phishing response down to close to zero. You know, our immediate goal is 5%. Uh, honestly, we'd like to get it to zero where we have no failures on a monthly basis. I was talking with our Department of Public Safety uh, a couple months ago and just lamenting the fact that, uh, geez, you know, we just cannot get people to pay attention and not click on messages and that they continue to click on them month after month. And uh, he gave me a great analogy and said, you know, you've been doing email testing and education for a couple of years. We've been trying to train the public on using their seat belts for over 25 years. And our highway patrolmen still respond to accidents where seat belts would have saved lives. Um, so uh, you, you're just a mere pup in the life cycle of trying to train and educate staff. And so keep that in mind as, as your degree of frustration continues. And that really hit home in that it, it's a great analogy in that, you know, most of the public you would assume is pretty adept to using seat belts these days. Hopefully someday we can get to that same level in regards to our fishing education and getting folks to kind of slow down and take, take an analytical perspective and not an emotional perspective to the process. So uh, that's all I've got, Meredith. I'll turn it back over to you unless uh, unless there's any questions or comments from the audience. Yeah, Jim, thanks so much. And just a reminder uh, to the audience that we are taking questions in the question panel since everyone is um, muted. So, uh, Jim, thanks so much uh, for the presentation. I especially liked some of the analogies um, at the end. And so, you know, in this public forum, I'm going to bait you, um, see what I did there since we're talking about fishing. Um, but talk a little bit about, you talked about an emotional response. Has there been a huge cultural resistance to change? And, and what, what happens when someone says, you know, I absolutely didn't click on that link. And do people argue with you? And what, what's that been like? Yeah, we, we absolutely get complaints every month on it wasn't me you know i don't know how you got to a second or third failure but that wasn't me and as we're all aware 
you know, computers are really good at recording things. And, you know, the first thing I do is uh, I send them a copy of the message, you know, to try and trigger the thought of saying, oh, okay, I did see that. Mm -hmm. I did fail, you know, the Trump tax back in April, you know, now that I recognize it. The, the other thing that we can do um, in our Power BI analytics, you know, we go specifically to the log records and we have the, the date that it was clicked on, we have the time it was clicked on, the computer, the iOS of the computer, you know, if it was a phone, you know, it's going to come up as uh, iOS. If it's Windows, it'll show as Windows, the browser. So um, we really have the advantage of talking back to them, explaining to them from a factual based perspective of here's the facts. You know, here's when it was actually recorded that you clicked on it. Um, and uh, we have not had a single issue once we present them with that objective data. Now, from a cultural perspective, um, our, frankly, part of our greatest challenge with it is from a, a PR perspective in that people understand the risks of cybersecurity to some extent, but they don't know how it really hits home and how it affects them. And so when we fish them, they think that we're out to do this from a punishment and a got them. You know, hey, we, we caught you. And that's, that's not what we're trying to do, but it's certainly a byproduct, byproduct of it. Um, you know, the, the bad actors out there have no scruples. You know, in, in anything that we're doing certainly doesn't come to the degree of what they're attacking us for. You know, um, natural disasters, you know, mimicking the Red Cross, mimicking disabled children, you know, these sorts of things happen on a regular basis from the bad actors out there. And so trying to educate our folks so that they understand, hey, this is real. You know, this could happen to you at work. It could happen to you at home. And if you don't learn what the tips and triggers are in order to analyze it from an objective perspective, you know, you are at risk. And even worse, you're putting sensitive state assets at risk, you know. And it's our responsibility as state CISOs, you know, we're looked upon to protect those state assets. And so I'm going to do as much as I can to educate and protect you know, our state uh, from a digital perspective. So it, it's a cultural challenge. You know, we are making progress. Uh, the folks that take our in-person training um, very much appreciate it, and they walk out of there with a great of understanding, um, but it is a cultural barrier to get over. You know, trying to educate folks that cybersecurity is at our front door every day. You know, and uh, thanks, Jim, for that. I also liked uh, the analogy um, when you were talking to your public safety director, because I think just as a um, you know, as a country, obviously, 20 or 30 years ago, we thought about physical crime and um, being victims of, you know, some sort of physical um, breaking in or injury or whatever. And now, of course, you know, it's likely that uh, most Americans will be exposed to some sort of cyber crime, cyber incident, and, you know, such a huge thing that states have to look out for. And you know, CIOs and CISOs know that, you know, reducing risk to the state is one of the most important things that they do. So um, really interesting stuff, and I appreciate you, you know, sharing with everyone um, your thoughts and, and uh, what South Dakota has kind of gone through, and um, interesting to, to hear about that. Um, you know, I think that you provided so much information that, you know, no other questions are kind of coming through. So, you know, Jim, I'll give you an opportunity to do some closing thoughts, and then we'll, uh, we'll close out. 
All right, thanks, Meredith. Again, uh, appreciation to NACIO and, and the other state CISOs for all of the information that's shared, not only through the webinar series here, but uh, through the list service. And I uh, always appreciate folks in, in sharing their experiences with them, good and bad. And there's a wealth of knowledge out there across the country, and this is certainly one of those areas where we're not competing for each other. This is not economic development where we may want to steal your company or you want to steal our resources or whatever it may be. We, we are all truly on the same page here. And uh, I like to think of the, uh, the good versus evil battle. So just appreciate all of the other CISOs across the country and, the, and their willingness to share their experiences. Now, we always like to say cybersecurity is a team sport, and it has to be. Um, so, Jim, thanks so much. Again, for those of you, if you want to share this recording here in the next day or so, it'll be up on NACIO's website. You can go to nacio.org forward slash cyber series. And, of course, here in a couple weeks, uh, we hope to see everyone who's going to attend NACIO's conference in San Diego. It's going to be a good one. Be sure and check out the conference website uh, for more information on that. So thanks so much for joining joining us on this Tuesday and have a great day everybody.